Hey guys, and welcome. We have a little special late breaking news. I'm still uh, editing the Tech Titan Impact Type video, but we had a major thing happen this past Monday, Labor Day. Um, I have my first classified Martian, and I'm super excited about it. We tried to do a, a really quick 101, Meteorite 101 on Wednesday, but we decided this is important enough, this is special enough, we need to do a whole little segment on it. So welcome to this bonus Meteorite 101 from our Knowledge Bolide Hangout. I wanna introduce uh, this Meteorite, NWA 15200, the 200 gram knock light and my two co-main mass holders, Mark Lyon and Sean Mahoney. Something very cool happened the day that the meteorite was published in the Met Bowl. We never know what day it's going to be published. It just happens. And it just so happened that my friend, Sean Mahoney, with his buddy Juan, who's also my grid friend, flew in from Spain for the Denver show. So on their way down to Tucson, they stopped at my house and we went out for cold beer and cheeseburgers. And I got to tell my friend, Sean, congratulations, shake my hand. We are co-main mass holders of a brand new Martian. We just had a great day. So this is the actual Met Bull entry and I'm gonna hand it over to Mike in just a second. But this is what he's going to be describing to us in his presentation. So the actual write-up in the Met Bull is very scientific as they are. At the end of Mike's presentation, we should be able to understand exactly what the description of this Martian means and how it uh, came to be formed. So maybe this will help you understand other Met Bull write-ups in the future. So Mike, I'm going to hand it right over to you, buddy, and I sure appreciate your time, man. Certainly. Thanks, Topher. Um, so first, I kind of wanted to cover the definition of the Nacolites. Um, So Nacolites are Martian cumulate igneous rocks. Um, so what that means is a cumulate rock is a rock that has large phenocryst, large crystals inside of it, because they formed in a magma and had a lot of time to grow within a magma. So they get big uh, and then their size causes them to settle out um, and accumulate, thus the, the cumulate uh, name to it. Um, and the nacolites happen to be really rich in augite. Um, and augite is basically just a form of, of uh, pyroxene, which we're going to get into. Um, so the uh, augite rich nacolites have typically between 69 and uh, like 81% uh, augite in them. And then the other major constituent in that rock is uh, olivine. Um, so they're considered uh, pyroxenites if you look at them from a, uh, a, a mineral standpoint. So uh, the olivine content can be somewhere around like three to 17%. Uh, and then they'll have some plagioclase in them, uh, some feldspar. Uh, and they also have something called uh, mesostasis, which we'll get into. Uh, and that can run anywhere from uh, like 8 to 11%. So combining those three major components together uh, with just a little bit of plagioclase, and you have a necolite. Um, so the necolites are kind of cool. There's a couple different theories on how they formed. You know, the old traditional theory is you're talking about a big magma chamber, and these things are sitting at the bottom of the magma chamber. Um, but a lot of the newer papers out there are talking about them being uh, either um, shallow intruded uh, uh, basalts that had some time to form the cumulate material kind of in the magma chamber and then it got kind of pushed up and in. Um, and the final result that we're seeing is, is not necessarily deep at the bottom of a magma chamber anymore, but it was uh, near surface laid or it was laid as actual uh, lava on the surface of, of Mars and then it was overlaid by more and more layers. Um, and so it was buried. Um, so there are some competing theories out there, which are kind of neat. So if you look in the Met Bull, it tells you there are 29 uh, nacolites. Um, but what's uh, you got to dig into it a little deeper than that. So just like how they classify all the Antarctic meteorites, um, there's a set of Miller Range meteorites and there's a set of Yamato uh, meteorites in there uh, from Antarctica. And so all of those were all found on kind of the same expedition. And each individual piece was given a number and thus a metal entry, um, but really they are just paired pieces of the same material from the same site. So drop those ones out. Uh, then you got a grouping of NWAs in the 10,000 numbers. All the 10,000 number NWA nacolites are all paired material. 
along with uh, the one uh, Nacolite that is a 11,000 series NWA is also paired to those 10,000 series. So those are all one big group. So in all reality, we really don't have 29 separate Nacolites. We really kind of have more like uh, 20 or 21 Nacolites with this one. Wow, that's awesome. And you're, we're talking out of about seven, 75,000 or something like that? Uh, yeah, so I think it's like 78,000, some, somewhere near there. Wow. Yeah. A lot of meteorites, not a lot of Nacolite. Exactly. Um, so one thing that's interesting uh, to understand is the formation of how these uh, magmas create uh, a stone that we see when you pick up like a piece of Nacolite. So a couple of things are going on. Um, as the magma starts and it's at a certain temperature and pressure, it'll start forming certain minerals first. And then as it cools and potentially it gets shoved upwards uh, through the stratigraphic layers of, of Mars, uh, the pressure decreases, the temperature decreases, and all of a sudden you form different minerals. Uh, so we said that uh, nacolites are uh, pyroxene and olivine rich. Uh, so you can see on this chart down here, uh, that the, uh, and this is from Alex's, Alex Steinkin's uh, website, um, the olivine is going to form first uh, at the highest temperature and pressure, and then later on you're going to form the pyroxenes. Um, and at the same time, on the right-hand side of the diagram, uh, you're seeing uh, anorthite and orthoclase, so that would be the uh, plagioclase minerals start to come in and form. Uh, and again, depending on when they form, you know, if it's, it's hotter and deeper, you're going to get uh, an orthite. If it's shallower uh, and at lower pressure, you're going to get uh, orthoclase. Um, hmm. And then, you know, typically we don't see quartz and other things like that in, in meteorites because we, we don't get that type of mineralogy forming out in the solar system besides really on Earth for the most part. Um, but that's called the Bowen's reaction series, and it kind of gives you an idea when we talk about the minerals and a little bit here of each type inside that nacolite, um, why certain things are happening and going on. Very interesting, man. Um, so we said that the first thing that really forms is olivine. Um, and so in this write-up, it says that the olivine is very uh, iron-rich olivine. Um, so again, uh, this, this is also off of Alex's his site. He's got some great diagrams on there. Um, so that bottom dark green bar that you see shooting across where it says MG2SiO4 uh, on the left and on the right, it says Fe2SiO4. Um, that's the olivine line, right? So you're talking uh, a composition that has magnesium or iron that can substitute for each other. And so you get what's called a continuous series between those two points, those two end members on the line. So the MG end member is phosphorite and the iron Fe end member is phthalite. And so uh, in your write-up topper, it says it's very phthalitic olivine. So it means it's sitting over there on the right-hand side. It's really high in iron. Um, and as we talked about in other 101s, um, that high iron content is great for forming shiny, beautiful fusion crust. Mm -hmm. That's nice and dark. <laughs> um, so the other thing that's mentioned in this, uh, this write-up uh, and being that it's an acolyte is that the olivines are a cumulate. So they had a long time to grow. So in this write-up, it says that the olivines are approximately one millimeter uh, in size. So that's a pretty decent size olivine grain. Uh, and the other thing is noted is that the olivine is not zoned. Uh, so what that means is as the crystal's growing, it has time to absorb different ions out of the magma. Um, Sometimes what will happen is when it starts forming, it'll be absorbing more of, let's say, magnesium. Uh, and then later on, as the magnesium gets used up uh, and it's already been formed in the crystals, there's basically only like iron left over for it to absorb. So you would get a crystal that was high in magnesium at its core. And then as you get towards the outside of the crystal, um, it would be more iron rich. So you have what's called zoning going on as the crystal grows. Um, in this case, the olivine is not zoned. Um, the other major constituent we talked about was augite, uh, and augite is a form of, of pyroxene. Um, so this one has an intermediate composition, whereas the uh, olivine was a two end member system. Uh, pyroxene is a three end member system. So you can kind of see we up the top, we have calcium, and then down the bottom left, we have magnesium, and the bottom right, we have iron. Um, so... Uh, 
if you're running just along the bottom and you can imagine that if you were at the points of these triangles at the very point, you'd be a hundred percent that ion in, in the uh, mineral structure and neither of the other two. Um, but as you get blends, if you blend along the magnesium and iron trends, you get enstatite or ferrocellite. If you start adding a little bit of calcium in there, they call those low calcium pyroxenes, you get pigeonite. Uh, and if you add a lot of calcium, mm -hmm. you get audrate. So that big red box up there um, that's kind of sitting towards the top of the triangle um, is audrate basalt, meaning that it's got a higher calcium content in there. Uh, and typically you're looking like 30 to 40% calcium uh, and you end up in that augite range. And in this meteorite, the augite is zoned. Um, so what that means is the core of the crystal uh, is more magnesium rich than it is iron rich. And then as you get to the edge of the crystal, it's more iron rich than it is magnesium rich. Um, so again, what that's kind of saying is this had a long time to kind of grow um, as, as the magma was cooling slowly. Uh, and so it had time to experience a change in the composition of the magma it was floating around in uh, and incorporate different ions. Nice. What about the plagioclase though? So plagioclase, <laughs> sure. Um, so in this write-up, it says that the plagioclase is andesine. Um, so there's a lot of different uh, plagioclases out there. And as you can see, this is also a triangle diagram. Um, and again, uh, you can have uh, potassium up top, you can have sodium on the bottom left, and you can have calcium on the bottom right. And depending on how much of each of those three ions you incorporate to equal 100%, uh, you'll get different forms of plagioclase. Um, so I put a little red arrow in here and I highlighted andesine. So you can see that andesine is really running along the bottom of the diagram. So there's not really any potassium in there. It's a, a blend of sodium and calcium. Um, plagioclase uh, it, that ends up making it neither end member. It kind of sits more towards uh, being a little more sodium rich than it is calcium rich. Um, so you can see there that the calcium uh, is like 30 to 50%. So the sodium is 50% or higher. It's, it's, the, it's the higher sodium uh, plagioclase. Um, and the interesting thing about plagioclase is that's also uh, those feldspars, when they melt on entry, that was, that's what gives you that nice glossiness to a crust. Um, so since this has a decent plagioclase uh, in there, it's got that nice glossy black fusion crust. And the other interesting thing about the nacolites are most of them are low shock value. Um, and the way they tell that is if you look at plagioclase, if you shock it really hard, high gigapascals, uh, it'll turn into diaplectic glass called masculinite. Um, and that is not found in this meteorite. So all the plagioclase is regular, plain old andesine uh, feldspar plagioclase. Uh, it hasn't been shocked to the point where it's transformed into glass. And then the, the last little bit on this is, so we said plagioclase wasn't a major component. So you form these big crystals of um, pyroxene and these big crystals of olivine uh, and the magma starts to really kind of run out of uh, liquid material. And so the plagioclase, formed later on in that series, that Bowden series. So it basically only has room to fill in the spaces around the uh, olivines and the pyroxenes. Um, so it's called interstitial. It's filling those little spaces in between the bigger cumulative grains. And that's a, that's a new term for me, interstitial. So I'm glad I was introduced to that term here. And um, there's another term coming up, metastasis, that I didn't know either. So I'm learning a bunch, and I hope you are too. So yeah, you had mentioned mesostasis. So this is kind of interesting. So as the uh, plagioclase forms and you're getting less and less magmatic material, you get to that very end where there's really almost no magma left. And mesostasis is what forms out of that real kind of residual material. Um, and what it basically is, it's very, very, very fine grained. And it's very, uh, in this case, titanium rich. And it's that last little bit of what gets injected between the crystals. Um, so you could almost think of it as kind of like the matrix or the glue that kind of bonds everything else together along with that very thin plagioclase um, around all these bigger crystals. And what's neat about the mesostasis in this meteorite is the pyroxenes and the olivine are very close in content and composition to uh, NWA 998. Um, 
but the mesostasis is what sets it apart. Um, so the mesostasis uh, quantity and material doesn't align with 998, uh, and that's what sets us apart and makes it have no parity. And that made me so happy. <laughs> I can't tell you how happy that made me. Um, the write-up also mentions ferroin hypersine, uh, which is just another term. Hypersine is just another term for uh, an orthopyroxene. Uh, so orthopyroxene means it's got an orthorhombic crystal shape. Um, and this one says that it's ferroin, so it means it's high in iron. And it mentions two things in the write-up. It mentions that uh, this ferroin hypersine forms its own little individual pyroxene crystals. Um, but it also mentions uh, that it forms rims around the olivine grains. So whereas the olivines weren't um, rimmed in the, in the nature of them having more magnesium cores and, and iron outsides, they do have iron-rich pyroxene coatings around some of the olivine crystals. So that they're, they're a, a rimmed crystal inside the, uh, the matrix. And we're actually looking at Mike's personal piece right there. That's just over three quarters of a gram, beautifully crusted with a little exposed interior on this side. Mike, I want to thank you very much for that uh, 101. It really helped me understand how special this meteorite is and how just rare Mars meteorites are and how much we're learning about them. I do have a small little video, 30 seconds, showing off my piece. I hope you enjoy this, guys. Look at those flow lines. Yeah. It's nearly a, a fully crusted individual, which surprised the heck out of me. But it does have a nice natural window in there. And you can see the interstitial material. <laughs> so thank you very much mike every week you blow us away with our 101s and i know you did a, a lot of extra work um getting this one ready so thank you very much i appreciate it hey pleasure's all mine thanks awesome. mike great thank job you. michael so that's it for this little mini episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm super proud of this Mars and we do have it for sale. So if you want to reach out to me, I will do, definitely hook you up with some classified rare Martian knock light and it'll be from the main mass holder. So I thank you for your support. Have a good one.